Hello to everybody. It's nice to see you all here. Uh, my name is Sandis. I'm a journalist from Latvian Television, and we are doing the environmental program. program. And also, besides that, uh, I did and we are doing also documentary films. And one of that was about the Baltic Sea, about Baltic Sea problems. So. I may be not completely in charge with the uh, Baltic Sea problems, but uh, I know the topics, that's, that's why I'm here and we'll, I will try to, want to moderate the, um, our discussion today. Uh, the program is we'll start with some panelists and some presentations, and afterwards there will be some discussions here, panel discussions. So I hope that uh, you feel free, you feel good, have this afternoon. And um, so. Please uh, feel free, just give questions, uh, any comments, uh, whatever, how you feel, just say it. And because our topic today is uh, green infrastructure and how it works, and, and we will start with uh, Anda Rusko. Please, uh, applause. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, My name is Anda Rusko. I'm uh, working also uh, for Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development within the Spon Baltic Scope project and leading uh, green infrastructure activity. So that's why I'm uh, here. And uh, so uh, I will give a short introduction to the se session and the topic what we are going to talk. So a little bit about the background. Uh, of course, there are many reasons why to talk about green infrastructure, but there is also a legal uh, background or, or policy context uh, behind it. And so uh, what probably is most important for us in Europe, it is uh, EU biodiversity strategy, which uh, the target two of the strategy also address green infrastructure. So it's about uh, uh, ecos uh, maintaining ecosystem services and restoring green infrastructure by 2020. And then the uh, European Commission has also developed uh, several documents in relation to green infrastructure, uh, also so-called EU green infrastructure strategy, which gives also a definition what what it is green infrastructure as such. And so it says that it is a strategically planned network of natural and semi-natural areas and other environmental features which are designed to and managed to, to deliver a wide range of ecosystem services. Uh, and uh, it incorporates green space and blue space and uh, uh, also other features in terrestrial and in marine areas. So this definition says that green infrastructure is something which also refers to marine areas. And that's why probably in the, uh, also in Pan Baltic Scope project, we have been trying to, to work on this aspect. Yeah, but so, what is marine infrastructure? Is it a network of existing protected areas which uh, forms the basis or yeah, core of green infrastructure? Sh shall this be ecologically or biologically significant marine areas, which, which is also another network uh, initiative uh, brought up by uh, com uh, Convention of Biological Diversity? So is it all benthic habitats uh, of high conservation value or core habitats for species, which gives the basis of a green infrastructure, or, the, or these are areas important for e ecosystem service supply. So these were also the questions which we tried in our Pan Baltic Scope project to, to answer, to understand. And uh, this was a reason also for uh, this session. So the aim of this session is, first of all, to introduce uh, to the Pan Baltic Scope approach of mapping marine green infrastructure. And this will be done by myself and my colleague Didzis. So we will present our results. And then we will look at other examples uh, similar related uh, to, to map, um, mapping of marine uh, green infrastructure. So we will have a look from a Latvian case uh, from presented by Solvita Strate from Latvian Institute of Aquatic Ecology. Then we will look at uh, uh, green infrastructure in relation to Swedish uh, MSP uh, by Jan Schmidbauer Krona. And then we have also, uh, uh, we, we will try to <laughs> look at the green infrastructure in relation Oscar. Yeah, to call Oscar, <laughs> Oscar, Oscar uh, Tornquist from uh, 
Swedish Geological Survey. Uh, so he is at home. He uh, he had a, his uh, defense of his uh, PhD uh, thesis today, and uh, so he could not be here. But so we will try to find out how this relates to to uh, green infrastructure, how it supports climate refugee, and uh, so uh, look in that dimension. And then we want to discuss opportunities and current limitations for applying this green infrastructure concept in MSP. It's uh, together with you and with our panel, which, which will be present here. And uh, we got also a task to formulate some kind of recommendations or uh, um, future vision, what, uh, where, how to go proceed with this issue of uh, marine green infrastructure, so which should be as output of our session. Yeah. So it's from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, please stay on. This is joining you. So on the next, uh, yeah. So, uh -oh. <laughs> Okay, so then I proceed with the next presentation, which we will have together with Deezis, and there are also a lot of other people behind this work, uh, all <laughs> listed here. And uh, so how we uh, defined marine green infrastructure and Pond Baltic scope project. So as I told already in introduction, we had a different perspectives how to look, it, look at it, and we had the, at the first workshops, there was a lot of discussions what we actually mean with that, but somehow we, we came to a, uh, a formulation uh, uh, that we de define marine green infrastructure as a spatial network of ecologically valuable areas which are significant for ecosystem health and resilience, for biodiversity conservation, and multiple delivery of ecosystem service. Uh, 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 of different ecosystem services essential for human well-being. So this picture illustrates this general principle, how we understand this marine green infrastructure. We try to assess ecological value of our marine waters and uh, ecosystem service supply potential. And we define where these values are highest in which areas they are highest, and those we uh, call like, or regard as green infrastructure. And uh, so our project was, uh, we, we had a specific task to develop this concept of marine green infrastructure and also to test it on available data, what we have in, uh, for the whole Baltic, Baltic Sea. So that was uh, the main challenge was to, to look at uh, the Baltic Sea scale. And uh, so we had a limited amount of data which are really um, uh, harmonized on the Baltic Sea scale when that was what we used. And uh, I think with this we also we address through two points which were also already brought up in the this morning, I think, in the ecosystem-based approach session. So we, we have this uh, uh, transnational perspective of uh, putting together different, uh, so, so not looking uh, beyond the borders and looking at the uh, Baltic Sea as one ecosystem. And we also recognize this, uh, we are not looking only on ecosystem service supply, but we are also looking at this intrinsic value of ecosystem and putting it together on a, like equal weights. We, we have uh, ecological value as such, and then ecosystem service supply, which is essential for humans. And so we combine uh, this within this, uh, concept of green infrastructure. And so the data, what we used for, for doing that, so as uh, yeah, the goal was to, to test it based on available data sets, we used uh, Helcom Maps and Service, uh, Helcom Maps and Data Service, which uh, includes several spatial data uh, layers on different ecosystem components. More than 30 ecosystem components are within this uh, maps and data service. We, in principle, tried to apply them all, but then we r realized that some are not really applicable for our context and some, for some uh, data uh, quality and accuracy was not really sufficient for our purpose. And so, especially if, with regard to fish species, essential fish habitats, we did a special attempt to, within the project to develop a new data sets. And actually, yeah, this is probably the 
the standard, as uh, we say, how, uh, how such data could be developed. So this will tell more about this essential fish habitat data. I'm not sure is it a standard, but <laughs> I will try to explain what we did with fish habitats. As a starting point, uh, as maybe somebody remember before this project, we had another very nice project, Baltic Scope. And as a, one of the final results, we had an essential fish habitat map. And uh, in the beginning, I really liked this map, a really nice cooperation between countries. We put together knowledge and maps what we use in national marine spatial planning. But then we, when we start to think, is, is it really good? Uh, because in Baltic Sea, actually, all major stocks are managed in international level. All knowledge are international, all uh, surveys, almost all fisheries are distributed on uh, international, on pan-Baltic Sea level. And uh, if we look in this map, for example, uh, uh -huh, I have dot. We have Gulf of Riga. There is some. We are located somewhere there in Riga. And uh, if we go from Riga, for example, to Tallinn, to Perm, is there any Estonians? Oh, hello. <laughs> Probably when you came from Tallinn or Pern to Riga, you didn't see any border control. But if you look on map, there is two different approaches. Latvian herrings are located in sense. There is borderline, and then it's somehow differently uh, distributed Estonian herrings. But in reality, we have even common Latvian-Estonian scientific surveys, the same stock assessment. Actually, it's a really nice small fish stock. We have knowledge about this stock, but still, at least in past, we mapped in different ways. Another example, a quite famous stock, uh, East, Eastern Cod. If you look, there is some Latvian attempt to map uh, some spawning habitats of Cod. There is some uh, Swedish attempt. It also covered a little bit Estonia. Actually, there is According to Estonians, no code. And the funny thing, at least Latvian and Sweden use the same publication. If I remember, it was Aero Aro 2000. One used a graphical approach, another country used a description. But as a result, it's totally different map. And we believe, again, we have better knowledge. We should just try to put on the maps and come together and uh, actually it was one of the recommendation from Baltic Scope, still, we're still in the past. And if we read very carefully recommendations, for me at least the main message was uh, jointly for whole Baltic Sea. And that's the thing what we try to do in our project. And I believe that we at least have uh, better maps what we had in the past. What we did, we defined fish species. We started with most commercially most important fish species. We found, uh, we call them uh, fish champions, the guys who were responsible for each fish stock. Uh, we had really nice expertise covering whole Baltic Sea, experts from many Baltic countries. As a highlight, we had the Essential Fish Habitat uh, Workshop. It was uh, organized together with Helcom and co-chaired by me, Lena and Henry. And uh, it was again organized in Riga. And a few examples what we did. Uh, you remember first map. It was also mapped uh, uh, code. Oh, there is some mistake. It's not code and flounder. It should be just a code. And if you remember this map, oh, somewhere in that point, some Estonians mapped there is nothing, Latvians <laughs> made some attempt, the Swedish. And actually last year our experts were more pessimistic comparing what we mapped a few years ago, and we believe this map is much more better and uh, up to date. And we also mapped uh, herring, 
It's also, aha, uh -huh, now I realize, it's a Baltic flounder, not cod flounder, it's Baltic flounder. It's actually also a map is quite unique because, uh, as you know, Baltic flounder, it's the only endemic fish species in Baltic Sea. Baltic flounder you could find only in Baltic Sea, according to the latest science. So that's what you could see. That's the first ever map, distribution map of Baltic flounder. So we made uh, many maps for cod, herring, sprat, European flounder, Baltic flounder, perch and pike perch. And the final result, we made also aggregated map. What we did with map, we gave to Anda. That was very good input for our green infrastructure mapping. So with that we covered the uh, fish uh, component in, uh, in our green infrastructure mapping, but on the other components like benthic habitats, uh, birds and mammals, we uh, wanted to yeah, uh, make use of uh, existing HELCOM data sets. And uh, so you will see how it um, uh, resulted. And so, as I told in the beginning in the concept, we had these two, two aspects to, to map. One was ecological value, and another was ecosystem service supply. So the next step was to, to assess the ecological value. And so we first um, uh, selected criteria against which we will assess uh, all these components. If they contribute uh, to, to particular criteria, so that means they are uh, essential for, for mapping it, this ecological, ecological value. So, um, so we assessed all the components of 30 components in relation to seven um, ecological value criteria like biological diversity, rarity, importance for uh, threatened, endangered and declining species and so on. So you see the criteria. We use the matrix approach. We simply Simply, uh, it, it was assessed in a binary scale, uh, zero or one, so either this component co contributes to particular criteria or not. And uh, so, shall we, is it considered as a, you know, characterizing this criteria. And based on this matrix, uh, then this infor uh, we selected from, uh, from uh, this, uh, data sets which, da which data layers have to go in our uh, mapping approach. And then we had a kind of aggregation of different uh, data. First, we, it was a mapping of uh, the ecosystem component groups by, by each of criteria, and it was aggregated on the level of ecosystem group, like on benthic habitats and species, and finally aggregating it all together. And here are some uh, examples. The uh, benthic habitat, which looks pretty well, fish, because it, uh, it also looks pretty well, because we even had a, better. Uh, even better. Uh, birds was not so-so, but we still use them. <laughs> Mostly it reflects uh, marine protected areas essential for bird species. But mammals, we were absolutely unhappy, because yeah, this information uh, layers, which we have in HELCOM data sets, that really do, do not fit for green infrastructure mapping, so we had to, for time being, to skip mammals from this exercise, but we hope that in future we will develop better data sets and, uh, and uh, include also mammals. And so this is aggregated map of ecological value. Then we had a similar exercise for mapping ecosystem services. There we selected 10 ecosystem services and again assessed all this uh, ecosystem components in relation to these 10 ecosystem services like filtration of nutrients, storage of nutrients, uh, erosion control, climate uh, control, and so on, and also recreation included here. And there we had a slightly different uh, aggregation approach. I will not go in details because we do not have time. <laughs> but anyway, we had so resulting like Bent, uh, ecosystem, map of benthic habitats contributing to ecosystem services, uh, eco, uh, uh, bad habitats contributing to ecosystem services, and aggregated ecosystem, uh, the, the map uh, of uh, this ecosystem components, which are more, most, or uh, ecosystem structures, which are most essential for supply of ecosystem services. And then we combine these maps of uh, uh, ecological value and ecosystem service value and uh, got an aggregated uh, green infrastructure map. Uh, mm, but we had to decide yeah, where this uh, threshold is, what, what is 
high value, and this was actually kind of arbitrary decision to, to, to take for experts. But so we decided to choose approach that we say 30% of the Baltic Sea space, which is highest value from an ecological value perspective or from ecosystem service supply perspective, we consider as a green infrastructure. So that was a, a approach for the uh, from decided in the project can be differently done, but that's that what we decided to use. And in conclusion, so yeah, to say we see that this uh, approach has a really good potential to be a, uh, and to to support implementation of ecosystem-based approach in MSP. Firstly, by improving the knowledge base on marine ecosystem structures, functions, and uh, relation to service supply and thereby contribute to relational understanding of uh, interactions between ecological and social uh, systems. And it also supports development of uh, spatial solutions in MSP by, you can, uh, by applying this knowledge and information, you can guide away potentially uh, harmful developments, guard away from ecologically highly valuable areas. And uh, this approach also of this Baltic scale mapping uh, supports cross-border coordination, coordination of planning solutions uh, by, in respect to ecological values. And it can be also applied in SEA uh, for assessing single or also cumulative impacts as it was also demonstrated before in cumulative impact session by Lena. But we uh, realize that there are still a lot of work to do and the methodology shall be further developed and improved. First of all, we should work on uh, to improve the data quality and so that our result is as good as the input data which we have. And you see if uh, currently we use this bird data which are not really representing uh, the whole marine area and so it has an effect on actual uh, result of the map. And uh, so we also need to address connectivity aspects. So in analyzing um, uh, yeah, connectivity between ecologically valuable areas, and we should also apply more co comprehensive approach to ecosystem service mapping, considering different spatial variations of biota involvement, of, uh, also to, to address uh, ecosystem condition, because that's very, on that actually the supply depends very much, and also the supply and demand relation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Is there some many questions? Maybe Estonians about code or there are some <laughs> students around I see? Yeah, please. Uh, hello, my name is Josephine. I'm from Germany and my question is why did you not consider also the pelagic environment? Oh, yeah, very good uh, question. We had a data set in general in uh, Helcom uh, map, map and data service with regard to pelagic habitats, but this would be a one uh, overall data set for whole whole um, uh, Baltic Sea. It uh, doesn't have spatial variations currently, so it would not give any additional uh, inf information for mapping. It would just add one data layer covering the whole Baltic Sea. So if we would have mo more elaborated data behind with spatial variations, we could use it. We also as assessed actually pelagic habit that uh, importance in relation to ecosystem service supply, but we could not uh, apply this in uh, mapping. No. Some more questions? Some more questions? Okay, then uh, thank you very much. And uh, some applause, applause on um, <laughs> our next speaker is Sovita Strate. She is also local and she is from Latvian Institute of um, Aquatic Ecology. So when the, the presentation will be about uh, marine GI mapping in Latvia, Basmati case study. I, 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 I hope it's not about rice or... Yeah, actually, thank or you for this possibility to present our case study. And uh, yes, uh, for some of you, named Basmati can maybe associate with Basmati rice. And actually, when I Google in the internet, I show I, I, I found a receipt how to 
uh, cook basmati rice in three different ways. And in our bonus basmati project, we have uh, three different case studies. And I want to say that one of the case study is Latvian case study, what I'm going to talk in my next slides. And uh, I, uh, some of you, I think a, a, a part of you already um, here in, in, in this morning session, in, in this ecosystem-based approach session about the Bismati project. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, one of the case studies, Latvian case studies, so-called marine protected areas, uh, that is because in, in the project, in our case study, we focused on benthic habitats, uh, again, and ecosystem services, but they are providing uh, marine protected areas, and as well as include in, uh, pro in, in, in project, we include socioeconomic aspects, for example, monetary valuation for, from specific ecosystem services. So, uh, yes, I want to show those pictures. Do you know where those are taken? Yes, I think you, uh, it's not in the Mediterranean Sea. Actually, it's in Latvian waters from the Baltic Sea. And I even know the location. It's the uh, Irbe Strait. It's connected uh, uh, just uh, when we entering in the Gulf of Riga. Uh, I am not a diver by myself, but my colleagues are, and they are taking those pictures. And uh, yes, when we're talking um, about benthic habitats, here, even here, we can see that benthic habitats <coughs> consist from algae, green algae, red algae, brown algae, and also mussels. So each of these uh, is ecosystem component. Uh, for example, mussel provides ecosystem services. But when it's uh, in different combinations, like in those pictures, then we can talk about benthic habitats. And also in the Baltic Sea, we have a benthic habitat classification system. And even for the Latvian waters, we identified more than 20 benthic habitat types. And of course, those benthic habitats are basis for marine protected areas network and also for green infrastructure. Um, in the next slide, I will show you this. Uh, on the uh, first, it seems very complicated graph diagram. But I will try to explain you that uh, in, in this uh, first uh, column, it's uh, ecosystem components. What I already said, here is listen, all components. For example, mussels, algae, and even pelagic components. It's zooplankton and, and phytoplankton. Usually, when we are um, making such uh, diagrams, we often, very often, I have seen that it's from ecosystem components, goes directly to functions, for example, mussels uh, filtrate, um, function is a filtration, and then goes further to ecosystem services. What we did in our case study, we include additional column, it's a habitat. So as I explained already in previous slide, because all those ecosystem components in, in, in different ways forming habitats. And then what else is, is new in this graph that um, uh, we can see, if you see what, what is done more, we can see even relative importance of each species and habitat in the provision of all those identified ecosystem services. And uh, this is done for all marine, uh, Latvian marine waters. Uh, we can also pick up even single ecosystem services. For example, um, nutrient filtration. And then here we can see that um, 
this uh, um, we can go back uh, so till ecosystem component and see how big is the, for example muscles part uh, in 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 provision this ecosystem service and yeah it goes uh, through function what else is important what we work further it is we adding spatial dimension that's very important for msp um, if we have uh, data and and uh, benthic data we can um, map the benthic distribution according this cl classification system uh, it was done to use the by our um, uh, monitoring data collected in, in in institute and all available different project data and that means that we can add those uh, ecosystem service and make those spatial dimension maps um, yes and uh, what's the key message that um, of course as more detailed data we will have as uh, better maps will be available and um, the most uh, of course all all the time the data comes uh, uh, we are um, analyzing it and and uh, the most recent data we use should no, we should use for mapping of ecosystem service supply and green infrastructure. Um, the benthic habitats for max mussels, for example, mussels, are of high relative importance in the provision of ecosystem service in MPA establishing process and green infrastructure mapping. And also, I would like to say that. Um, of course, with better data coverage, the green infrastructure map could be expanded, connecting coastal zone with deeper areas. Yes, thank you. Is there some questions or, or comments or, or everything is clear? Uh, please. Uh, hello, uh, Jonas, Jonas Paulson from the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. I was wondering, are you going to use this to, uh, as a basis for arguing where to do increased um, environmental uh, monitoring in the future? To increase environmental monitoring? Yeah, uh, in the areas where you see that you don't have enough data cover, will you, you, w will you oh. try to suggest to whichever government to increase the monitoring in those areas? Thanks. Um, yeah, we would be happy if uh, would be possible to increase monitoring activity in our waters, of course, and it will increase our re resolution of maps and our uh, solutions and everything. Yeah, we would be happy if <laughs> this would happen. Okay. Some more comments or okay let's let's move forward. Thank you. Thank you again. And um so it <laughs> so the um, and now we will continue with the guests from uh Sweden. Jan Schindmo Krona is uh, representing Sweden in the Helcom and uh, uh, Jan will present approach applied uh, in Swedish MP MSP for addressing the marine green infra infrastructure. Is this correct? Yes. Okay, the ground is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jan from Sweden, uh, working uh, at the agency responsible for Swedish uh, MSP. We're delivering plans to government uh, now in December, so we're really busy. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we have managed uh, green infrastructure in the Swedish plans and is answering the question of how to boost the MPA system. 
Does everybody know what the MPA system is? The Marine Protected Area. The idea of having a network of protected areas uh, protecting the core biodiversity of the sea. And the first question has to be, does this system need boosting? What do you say? Yes. Yes. Anybody against? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, the answer is yes. Yes. And uh, then because, because now we have this, uh, I'm trying to this kind of, not really a jump scare approach, but uh, because, <laughs> because without green infrastructure, we won't be fed. Because, you know, we have the provisioning ecosystem services. We eat the fish and the mussels and the algae, perhaps. And without green infrastructure, the world would be dead. Yeah, it's the worst case scenario, <laughs> death. Uh, but ultimately, green infrastructure is about life. To protect life. Have you seen the fifth, fifth element, the movie? No, you could do that. Uh, without green infrastructure, then we have this aha part. It's kind of from, is it Swedish to kind of, when you realize, ah, that's the thing. So it's aha, <laughs> without green, it doesn't really fit the melody though, but without green infrastructure, aha. <laughs> okay, we sing it all together, then I continue my presentation. Uh, without green infrastructure, the world won't be fed. Green infrastructure, the world will be dead without green infrastructure. Ah, ha, green infrastructure. Ah, ha. Uh, okay, I continue. Uh, we, uh, the point is that we won't be able to reach the environmental targets if we only think about the MPA system. We have to think in a broader context and that we have biodiversity outside the protected areas. Uh, and why should MSP care? Because MSP is a spatial uh, planning or policy or management tool which uh, has at least the utopian possibility to have a, a holistic approach. And as a basis for that, you have to consider the current uh, status of nature which is actually what uh, green infrastructure is about. So when we started uh, planning in Sweden uh, in 2012, we soon realized that we needed a picture of where we actually have uh, important nature values to consider in MSP. Uh, so now we're at the third generation of green maps, which we call them, to kind of aggregate uh, green infrastructure and to when uh, balancing different interests in MSP, we have a basis in looking at these maps and seeing, okay, hmm, here we have to maybe have a conflict, so we have to investigate. Uh, and what is actually the green infrastructure uh, symbolizing? Is it birds or is it uh, marine mammals? So we have to check. Uh, we also developed this system with including green infrastructure in the actual plans. We have the so-called small N areas uh, the big ends are the protected areas, the planned protected areas, or so-called national interests for nature conservation. Uh, but the small N, N areas are totally new. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure, you might be aware of these uh, OECMs, Other Effective Area-Based Conservation Measures, uh, just included in the discussion of uh, raising the target to 30% of uh, on MPAs. And we actually think that uh, our small N areas included in the marine spatial plans, they uh, fit quite well as these OECMs. I think the OECM criteria are, it should be clear a geographical scope or uh, borders. Uh, they should be long-term and they should also have a clear uh, conservation uh, aim linked to it. Uh, so we have a discussion in, at the national level about calling them OECMs or not. But still, they have that function. Uh, if we look at what uh, has been included or added in the Swedish MSP, let's see if I got this red dot working. 
these are the, the three different plans uh, covering the Swedish waters. We have, de have developed three plans. And they actually are quite uh, different from a biological perspective. And that shows to quite a large extent in the percentage which is uh, protected. And uh, on this west coast where we have the most uh, uh, salty or saline uh, uh, waters with the highest level of biodiversity, we have uh, more uh, protected areas uh, than in the northern Bosnian Bay. But we, I, the main point is to look at this uh, particular conservation of high nature values uh, row, where you can see that we have, through MSP, added 8% in the Gulf of Botnia, 13% in the Baltic Sea, and 10% in Skagerrak and Kattegat. Uh, using uh, green maps and uh, green infrastructure uh, knowledge, and having certain criteria for this, uh, to be able to uh, pinpoint them in the, and I can show you a map. Well, you can't really see the small N areas that well, but they are uh, in different places uh, here. And uh, the idea is that by including them here, you can also link them to, to measures in the future, to, to environmental management, which wouldn't have been done uh, otherwise. So our conclusion is that MSP should contribute to environmental management, and that could be, by, that should be by considering green infrastructure in planning, and this is a possibility to include identifica identification of these uh, uh, OECMs or whatever you want to call them in your plans, and that the green infrastructure maps can be a basis for this identification, uh, and this is a link to Oscar. Uh, climate refuge areas uh, should also be can also be one of the criteria for uh, for identifying these areas. Uh, we have done that on the preliminary uh, maps on climate refuges, uh, but as uh, Jonas mentioned on the previous session, we are waiting for uh, better results, uh, which partly is what Oscar is presenting very very soon. Thank you very much. Oh wait wait wait. wait, wait. <laughs> I got my last slide. <laughs> so yes, the answer is yes. Marine green infrastructure and MSP can boost the MPA system. And uh, still remember to listen to your guest heart. <laughs> Groove is in the guest heart. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Maybe some, is there some questions? Any questions or? or, or uh, everything's fine? OK, we move forward. So. Um, Next, uh, next guy will be again uh, from Sweden, yeah? We'll try to call him mm -hmm. Oscars, so he'll be on Skype. Okay, so, uh, yes. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, future green infrastructure considering climate change. Together with Gothenburg University, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, and the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, we try to future-proof marine spatial planning by assessing coming ecosystem changes. Click. <laughs> you have to click there. We are. Oh, yeah. Did you press uh, the button? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, no, no. Back. Back? Yeah, yeah just, just one, one click. Ah, uh, sorry. Go back. So, yeah. Uh, so, in the Climb Marine project, a set of new climate models have been produced. And in Pan Baltic Scope, these models have been used to model future ecosystem components. Now we can click again. <laughs> From what the models tell us, there will be future drastic changes to the Baltic ecosystems. We have used two scenarios and model changes for the year 2100 with respect to salinity, temperature, sachet depth, and nutrients. One small click. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the first set scenario represents, do you see a graph there? I, I, I don't see it. 
Is there a graph? Yeah, it should be. Okay. Uh, in the first scenario, um, it represents a concentration effort to mitigate change and approximately two and a half centigrades of global warming. A small click. Yeah. The second scenario represents a less fair situation where society fails at making drastic changes and we reach approximately four or five centigrades of global warming. Uh, here, the example of salinity today and the, the two scenarios. The scenarios take economy and society into account, as well as water management, etc. From current trends, the more severe scenario uh, to the right actually seems more plausible. In these examples, uh, we see that increased precipitation and runoff creates lower salinity in the whole Baltic region. Click. In these maps, we see the model increase in bottom summer temperature, and we likewise see warming in the whole area, proportionally worse in the deeper basins, where two to four centigrades make a huge change. In shallow areas in the South Baltic, temperature may result in stress for some species, such as bladderwrack or soft marina. Click. With these climate changes in mind, we have focused on some habitat forming key foundation species, namely the three focus variants, eelgrass, blue mussels, and the proposed replacement to primarily Sostra, that is Stuchenia pectinata, which in the future can come to colonize areas previously inhabited by more salt dependent species. We have tried not only to model habitat suitability or probability in presence of the future but also take connectivity into account, namely the importance of habitat patches as sources for the network and the strength of habitats by analyzing them as sinks for larvae, seeds, etc., from the network. So it's a communication be between patch and network. Click. Uh, we have modeled the species across the Baltic using a number of predictor variables and modeling methods producing an ensemble result with high accuracy. Click. <laughs> Professor Per Johnson at Gothenburg University has performed connectivity modeling based on the habitat models. And the distribution models have been weighted with the connectivity strength to form future hotspots for importance and resilience, source and sink. So we actually multiply the probability of presence for the habitats with the, the, the sink and the source strength for the network. Uh, click. And the model produces robust results for today, but the future is of, of course uncertain, especially for salinity, which is the most important factor actually. So we click. And as an example, we can look at Metilus and Bladderack, model based on the situation today and predicted for the two scenarios. Probability expressed in intensities of yellow in the map. Uh, so if you click one, this is now uh, probability of uh, uh, Metilus today. If you click once, uh, you can see that it uh, disappears from the northern part at uh, the uh, the most um, the, the least severe uh, scenario, and we click it again. We can see that uh, it is almost gone from the central Baltic. So, if you take an, an, another click, so this is uh, which species is this? I don't see from. Focus. Okay, so this is focus. Okay, okay, so this is focus. So you, you can you can actually click two, twice, two, two times now to see the, the 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 change. So, as you can see, we predict major shifts in the ecosystems, and it, this goes for all species. They they move southward, and even so, these um, uh, focus um, uh, uh, radicans, which actually lives in, in in the north part of the. Uh, area that actually moves south, so it colonizes this area. Uh, so a, a new click. If we zoom in from the distribution of suitable habitats, we can estimate locations important for future habitats, the refugia or last stand in light of climate change. 
shown in the map to the left. The encircled areas seem like good candidates for protection and monitoring, and they're part of the MPA plan, actually. To the right, uh, if you click one more, I think, yeah. To, to the right, future habitat suitability has been weighted with sort of strength, which shows that the northernmost habitat patches are not that important for the network as a whole. Rather, the Swedish mainland along the Baltic proper, together with westernmost Estonia, will probably be the most important areas for this species, for the Baltic as a whole, in the future. Because the, the northern patches are so, so small, so they disappear in the, in, in the network. So another click. Nope. Okay, this is also okay. I, I had another example. Another. Okay. So in all, then we have produced maps of probability, strength, and importance for the network in rate of climate change for the selected species. From these maps, regional statistics can be drawn to assess the severity of change and implications for ecosystem services and GI. Uh, and uh, we can also, as they, these models have a high resolution of 200 meters, we can actually use them in uh, future proofing the marine spatial plans to take account of uh, future possible strong areas for, for these species. Um, an important future task would then be to improve the model, add more species, and also model species with interspecies dependence. So we can, use, for instance, model fish, taking into account how bladder rack or, or sostra moves. Um, so that's what is another, a last click. So thank you. <laughs> some questions, or in, do you have something to ask uh, the Oscars? How was your, how was your PhD today? Uh, I'm a little bit uh, tired right now. Too too much uh, bu bubbly wine and uh, too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We don't see you, so we're just here. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I will ask a panel a panelists uh, please come and take a seat, and um, and we will also, as we have a small concert here, one song. We will also would like to ask, uh, make some voting, and ask one question, uh, like uh, make small, um, yeah, small voting, and the the question is. Um, uh, should we call it green or blue infrastructure? And uh, Martin, uh, could you please uh, point where we can vote it, where we can vote, vote and uh, give our voice, so our, our our opinion. So yeah, it is here, MDI you see on screen. So yeah. Observe, please open it and uh, please give your uh, Vote and but 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 panel, panelists, please uh, slowly take uh, take seats, take chairs. Slowly or fa fa fast, uh, up to you. Yes, six chairs. So. And please uh, try to please try to make a voting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see on screen uh, what results is now. Looks like we need to change the title of the wor workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and uh, I will introduce um, our panelists, our uh, discussion um, participants. So we'll start with the ladies, uh, Christine. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. So, uh, sorry if I uh, not correct. Uh, you are from UNESCO, yeah. Uh, can we give a microphone also to share? No, it's better. Uh, because it's online also. Um, 
so yeah, I'm Cristina Cervera. I work for IS UNESCO in the MSP Global Initiative, uh, specifically in the Western Medi Mediterranean um, case study. And uh, I have a background in environmental sciences, and then I specialize in MSP through the Erasmus Mundus mar Master Course. Very shortly, maybe then uh, we'll start from yeah, from this, uh, maybe from here, from here. Magdalena Matuczak, I'm from Poland, from Maritime Institutes, uh, and I'm a marine biologist from profession, but I'm working with maritime special planning for the last 10 years. Hello, I'm Janika Bori. I come from WWF European Policy Office in Brussels, uh, where I mainly work on poli policy issues related to marine spatial planning and marine protected areas. Um, but I have a background in scientific studies. I'm a marine biologist and a diver, and I, I started my career diving in the dark, muddy waters of Finland. There's pretty waters as well, but mostly I dive in the muddy waters. So that's, that's where I bring my inspiration from. Man with the most complicated na name, yeah? Here, Paolo Campostrini. I'm coming from uh, the flood of the Venice. And uh, my background is uh, in engineering, and I am presently a director of a research center where many interdisciplinary research is uh, done in order to support uh, the decision uh, concerning safeguarding of Venice. But apart from this, uh, I am also involved uh, since many years in the maritime spatial planning uh, as uh, we were the first uh, uh, coordinator of the project, uh, pilot project in the Mediterranean Seas. Hello, my name is Lena Bergström. I'm from the Helcom Secretariat. I'm a marine ecologist and uh, have a special interest in environmental assessment and uh, uh, MSP. And now recently also with the Pan Baltic Scope project, where I've been involved in cumulative impact assessment and green infrastructure. Hi, I'm Yuri Seigers. I'm from Latvia, from Latvian Institute of Aquatic Ecology. My background is in biogeochemistry. So as our today's topic is um, green uh, infrastructure, so we'll start is what is, um, how do you think, what is a marine um, green infrastructure co concept good for? Yours. Uh, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of different opinion, not, I'm not in favor of, of using it, it as an alternative from marine protected areas, because it's 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 very good concept. It's it's very useful concept, but in in a slightly different way because the name infrastructure by itself gives a meaning. So somebody is using this infrastructure, spawning in one place, ri rising children in another place, feeding in third place. All those places are equally important. So in 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 essence, if we map this infrastructure, we have much better understanding what we should look for, what we should protect. And marine protected area for me is something last resort. Everything is lost. It's a last bastion. It's, we, we protect what's left. And, and this is not the case. We should protect even before everything is lost. And, and, and in green infrastructure or whatever, blue infrastructure, I don't care. It, it gives a possibility to, to really look into it and not damage one part of of, of whole. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Janika, uh, Janika Borg, what, what's your opinion on that? I think, um, as we saw from uh, Jan's presentation, it, it can be used for improving the MPA network. Uh, I think it's also good to have parallel uh, approaches, so what we apparently are going to call blue infrastructure, perhaps. Um, it, it doesn't have to be an either-or approach. It's good to have this mapping exercise so that we really know what's going on. And I, I take the opportunity to show to you how little we know. So um, this is a summary of a recent publication from September this year, uh, Protecting Our Ocean, Europe's Challenges to Meet the 2020 Deadlines. This is a WWF publication where we assessed the situation of MPAs right now. And uh, you shall grab a copy when you leave. Uh, the main thing is we are only protecting less than 2% of Europe's seas with management plans at the moment. So you know the designation number is higher than that, but the management plan is uh, development is lagging behind. 
Which brings us to the point that if we look at the green infrastructure at the same time as we also look at the MPAs, we, these things can indeed boost each other. Mm -hmm. Magdalena, can you please continue? Um, okay, so I'm, I was also a part of the Pan-Baltic Scope, so I will not say a bad word about the green infrastructure co concept. Uh, but I'm also a planner. Uh, we have uh, finished just the Polish uh, plan uh, some uh, months ago, and I have some experience with our uh, mapping. We didn't use the green infrastructure concept in Poland, but we call it a valorization. So, but just uh, like the methods were the same. But I'll, um, I think it's, it's something different than just a network of protected areas because we are thinking about the ecological processes, like this connection between the spawning and nursing, so that the connection between the areas should be protected because they, they, they are like a chain. But I also, I don't know whether Oscar is still online, but I, I liked very much his, uh, uh, his uh, presentation because green infrastructure, which we were thinking and we, which, we, we, which we've done in our plan, it was just a mapping of the status quo at this moment. But we should think about these future changes because planning is about the future. So if we want to uh, protect something by plan, by, by, so we have to know where the changes will be and how we can uh, mitigate those changes in the future. So this future look, is a future uh, vision is very, very good. So thanks for this Oscar presentation. Hello, I don't know where are you, but thank you very much. No, Christina. Um, okay, so um, the answer to the question about the, what is green infrastructure good for, uh, I would say it's good for to implement MSP really based on, uh, on ecosystem management because actually green infrastructure goes beyond uh, MBAs. Uh, MBAs are just lines drawn. Um, sometimes we don't know exactly which are Okay, we, don't, we know what is inside the MBA, but we haven't assessed the ecosystem services that they provide. Um, so I really think it's a good uh, concept to really implement the MSP um, ecosystem uh, in an ecosystem-based management mm -hmm. way. L Elena, you didn't say? Or yeah, yeah. I have to go back to reading the question mm -hmm. even. Yeah, this is um, so, so, so the green infrastructure concept is good because it highlights the, the important areas and it's also a way of showing why they are important, not only that they are important. Mm -hmm. And I think another distinction also when you compare with protected areas, there's often the incitement for having an MBA that there needs to be something that's already threatened and already listed. But this is a way of also ensuring that those that are actually, these could be species and habitats that aren't quite, quite common, but we need them. Yeah. So it's another way of defining ecological value and the way we use them. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I may, last and maybe the least, but, uh, but, but uh, I think that uh, there are some infrastructure which uh, were not born to be green, but uh, we can be, make them green. Uh, we can paint. Uh, uh, some infrastructure. Let's say, for instance, we have some uh, uh, you know, some uh, plant for extracting oil, hmm? which uh, suddenly became uh, uh, useful for uh, for uh, for natural because this is a, a o OECD, no? So a place where uh, other people do not go. It, it, it is coming similar to a reserve uh, for ecolo of ecological value. And therefore, it, can, it depends on how you use also this infrastructure. So there are some infrastructure which maybe they were, they were uh, thought in another way or they came up uh, for, uh, for another use. And may this, uh, if uh, correctly used, can be used also for maintaining ecological and ecological value. Especially this uh, would occur where, uh, the, as in the Baltic Sea, but also in the Adriatic Sea where I live, Everything is uh, very close uh, one to the other, so you cannot, uh, if you want to enlarge the spaces, you have to adjust uh, better, no? So if you want to reach uh, the 10%, the 20%, or, or even more uh, of, uh, connect, uh, of ecological protected areas, surface, and, and, uh, and you, you must also use what you have. No? And uh, maybe that a uh, different approach, uh, you can uh, also try to make uh, green some thing that does not or green or blue, something which uh, was born with a different use. So it's very much depending on the use. 
this is the first thing that I would like to say. There is another one, that, but I will say later. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe some comments uh, from from you, from because it, it's a, it's a discussion. It's not like uh, sh it's not our show here. <laughs> so please participate and uh, uh, ask some questions or comments. Um, please join join us. Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. So we we're talking about green infrastructures to like kind of reach the threshold of of twenty percent of uh, protected places. But are these? Do you think these infrastructures would have the could have these same level of protection? that MPAs would offer, or, or what kind of protection can they get exactly from MSP? Who can answer? No. <laughs> maybe, Lena, Lena, maybe you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hel Helcom. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah, it's on, right? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> it works. Um, I mean, I would think just uh, based on what I heard, that it's not the aim to protect these areas, that it's more the, it's a supporting thing. So, so it's, um, as Lena said, to also recognize the value of things that are not yet threatened, but not included in the protected areas network. So I, I think, because I think I have used the, 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 the word protection within our plans, so it's not the protection like in, in a sense of maritime protected areas, but protect it in a, in a, uh, within a plan like that, that we don't plan any activities that will harm or uh, hamper the, the, the psychological processes. This maybe protection is the wrong word, but yeah, but not a statutory protection, okay? That's my opinion. Okay. Some more comments or? Yuris, uh, I think you want to join discussion, yeah, I see. Oh, did this, did this, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, okay. Uh, so the next question is about, uh, uh, in, uh, in schedule, it's about current limitations, um, obstacles, reasons for not mapping uh, marine uh, green infrastructure. So do you see any? Um, yes, well, I can give an insight about the limitations. Um, actually, it's not uh, the concept of green infrastructure on the marine environment is not still uh, in developing uh, phase. Um, and some people are talking about um, applying the way of doing on land, on the sea, but uh, it's not the same environment. I mean, in the sea, we have the three, di three dimensions, and actually someone already asked about the pelagic environment. So probably one of the limitation is these 3D considerations that we need to have. And also the answer to that question was that they didn't have uh, quality data for the pelagic uh, environment. So probably another limitation is the data. So quality and quantity maybe, I don't know. Mm, others, Yuris? Yes? If I may, the, the also I would like, uh, really I'm curious of which kind of concept are we applying here because uh, uh, when you think about an infrastructure, you see something solid, which is a pl place in some way, you know, in, in a place. And while uh, in, this, in this kind of things, uh, everything which uh, could help, you know, the, the, the better mapping and the better use, uh, sustainable use, because uh, as you said, maintenance is, is about sustainable use and not about protection. You know? So also the satellites uh, which observe the what, what is happening is a part of, of observing infrastructure which must be green in the sense that it helps you in managing in a proper way, in a sustainable way, this environment. So the concept of marine infrastructure is quite, should be, in my own opinion, a bit, a bit wider you know, in order to include also the uh, immaterial infrastructure, so the connection we should be able to see the, the ecological connection with, between different places. The MPA itself uh, do not uh, means so much. Is uh, the, the, con the ecological connection between uh, the different MPAs, which can give uh, really the difference, because it helps uh, in a proper way the, uh, the full environment uh, to, to develop and uh, to be sustained. 
co-evolve in a sustainable way with, a, with a, the use of the environment by our, our human species that we are. Uh, so in, in this sense, uh, I think that uh, the reason for not mapping uh, is, uh, is our fault, uh, is our lack of, uh, of uh, fantasy in order to see what, uh, what we have uh, in our hands in order to understand better to, and uh, to provide uh, a common uh, use of this system, uh, connecting the different pieces uh, in order to have uh, uh, an infrastructure which can allow us uh, to, uh, to, understand, to see, to understand what is happening, uh, and uh, uh, to fa try to put uh, the, through the maritime special planning uh, uh, the, the correct things uh, in, uh, in, in order. No? So, we, so there are, you cannot overlap everything. Uh, so you, you put in order the things uh, and you say, OK, the, which is the vocation of this area? What are the, the places where this kind of, uh, of uh, as, we, as we saw, species can stay better? Or are the vocation of these areas no, for this? And what are the vocation of, of the other things? If we uh, the, the green infrastructure is uh, any green infrastructure is uh, any way of, of uh, an which connects the, the, the capa your capability to have a better uh, understanding what is happening in the in the wool area that you are considering uh, in uh, in the sea. And uh, okay, when once you have understood, you can also say okay, let's uh, stay stay there. Ships uh, stay there. Fishermen stay on the other side, uh, and uh, here we can put uh, the other things. But uh, the, infra the green infrastructure uh, alone, uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, in, in the sea there is a little sense to nominate one single point as, a, as green uh, more than uh, the other. Also something which was born as not green at all could become green if, uh, if it's properly used. Should I continue? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would like to add also, I agree on what was said with, with the data and knowledge and how you understand it. And, and also from the, if we go back to, to the limitations and reasons for not mapping, one, one obstacle is still in communicating green infrastructure. We are already here in the room, hearing that people wonder what is it. And it's also people think that I work with maybe transportation infrastructure can miss it with other concepts when the word infrastructure is used. So this is also a way that it's not as a concept, not widely used yet, even though it appears in, in different uh, policy contexts. And also there is a bit of a difficulty when, when it's first, it's a concept that was transferred from terrestrial environments to the marine environment, but the bio biology of, of the marine environment is so different in terms of uh, connectivity and and we have three-dimensional system, as was mentioned. So, so there are many things that you cannot directly transfer from the terrestrial setting and to the marine setting. Although the use of the same word would suggest that you can. So one also has to realize that when you talk about green infrastructure in the marine environment, you need to redefine it as well. So that also takes some time. Mm -hmm. There's some comments in the forum and uh Somebody uh, writes, not blue or green, but ecological infrastructure. And the other supports, yes, yes, ecological infrastructure. <laughs> uh, there is some questions. Uh, for example, what is the effect of uh, using the term infrastructure in green, blue? Infrastructure in terms of public perception, does it help people get engaged? Uh, people know what infrastructure is, or is it confusing? So that is uh, better worded than I just tried to explain, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, to continue on Lena's point, um, I hadn't heard about green infrastructure that many times before I came here. And yes, maybe the wording isn't the best one, but this happens quite commonly. It's quite okay to change the word. Um, so I think, yeah, the limitation for, for now being one of them would be the terminology used. Um, but looking at this from a policy pr perspective, I would say that it's most welcome to have more information about green infrastructure in all, all UCs, because that would be very helpful for all the MSP plans being made right now, certainly feeding into so something that's a big hole lacking in most of the processes. So I, from that perspective, I, I see it, it uh, as a good chance. Mm -hmm. And the third main question in our discussion is about uh, what actions can be taken at national and international level to support integration of uh, GI concept in uh, MSP. So 
So if I go first on this one, uh, I gave it a little bit of a thought before I came here on, on uh, how this would be met in Brussels. And uh, I think based on what I've seen here today, uh, it's, it's a good starting point, but it's still a little bit of a seed. So um, maybe the packaging isn't quite right. Maybe that what you have there is good, but it should be packaged in a easily approachable way. But uh, I would say that after that, uh, this is definitely something that um, I think the Commission could be interested in uh, looking into and, and maybe providing as guidance to member states if they see fit. But this is the type of things that they sometimes do with uh, different sectoral approaches. Mm -hmm. What Polish uh, colleagues say? Hmm. Um, well, I, I have to say that uh, uh, I think we, 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 we tried from the beginning to integrate this concept, maybe not, as I said, we, we didn't call it the green infrastructure, but uh, it was almost the same in our Polish uh, planning uh, process. And uh, when you start from the beginning, that this uh, green infrastructure concept, it's, it, it became like a, one of the paths the planning process goes through. So I think that the, the best action is just to integrate it from the beginning, starting from the valorization of the, not, not, not to jump with the green infrastructure in the middle or at the end of the process. So not to leave it for the strategic environmental impact assessment, but following the ecosystem-based approach, integrate it from the very beginning, and then these concepts start to be just naturally a part of the process. So this is like we've done in our case, and I hope that in 10 years when the Polish plan will be revised, it will be still the case. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm not talking here about the funds which should be given to the research and so on, but uh, if you want to keep this uh, topic on this um, um, MSP level, that then, then just uh, awareness rising and keeping this uh, good practice, I think it's, it's, it's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So from the international perspective, uh, as uh, IOC UNESCO, um, uh, in MSP Global, we are uh, developing some training courses, so capaci capacity building on MSP. Um, of course, we always mention <coughs> ecological and biological uh, significant areas. But uh, we didn't, I mean, we usually don't talk about green infrastructure, and maybe we should start doing it and incorporating that term uh, inside the, the whole ecosystem-based approach for MSP. So that will be for the international perspective. And then for the national perspective, I know a case uh, of a country that uh, <coughs> actually is Spain, that when transposing the MSP directive into the Spanish legal system, they, uh, they, they add the, to the, this uh, Article 8 of the MSP directive that we have all the activities that we have to include in, M in MSP, they add also uh, elements included in the green infra infrastructure uh, strategy. Uh, we still don't have that element, and so we don't have developed the mapping for green infrastructure. When we have it, we will directly, legally include it in the MSP plan. So that's nationally uh, a good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pierre Powell, please. Your. I mean, uh, uh, again, uh, is a matter of wording, I, I agree with you. So uh, I think that uh, in principle uh, at the sea, I would not see to, to build any infrastructure which is not green you know, in some way, no? Because uh, uh, today we cannot uh, uh, simply build something, uh, even a transport line, no? between a, a ferry line between a, an archipelago, no? connecting. We have uh, to make uh, this kind of, of, which is useful for, for the connection of people, for the mobility, for the economy. No? It's necessary to, con to connect the people. Uh, also, this, this kind of, of infrastructure, which is a mobile infrastructure, is made of, of ships, of ferry boat, uh, and must be, must be as green as possible. No? So it could be also used as a, a way to understand better, as I said before, no? because you can put some instrument on that. So that the line, even uh, um, I, I do not see uh, any possibility to build an infrastructure in at uh, uh, a new one uh, in, in, the, in the marine environment 
which uh, is, is not green at the moment. So, because uh, 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 also uh, an extraction uh, uh, plant of, of gas, of oil, no, which is uh, considered from somebody, oh, but well, this is the worst thing, uh, is, more, is, the, is a black, no? it's black like the oil, no? it's not green, it's black. <laughs> also black infrastructure like that uh, should, be, should be seen uh, in a multi-use context, uh, try to find the way it can be useful for, for the environment as well. No? So it's the multi-use of the infrastructures uh, that is the real key for, for, the, for, for, the, for the next pro period. And I, I believe uh, that we should look, uh, we should try to have uh, uh, at least a little uh, green use of any infrastructure built on the sea from now on. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Lennon, what's your opinion? Say something. Yeah, no? we can. Say we wrong, can. Wrong. No, not not wrong, but but uh, <laughs> probably I will say something which is not in line. But you have all said, because I think that that, that the, the ideas and the, uh, are used already. So we we at least what I have seen, those those environmental values are taking account in, in, in special planning. We don't call it green infrastructure, but, but, but still we, we consider what's there, what can harm those values, and, and based on that we can adjust activities which are planned in, in certain areas. For, for me, it seems that, that, that up to the point we have knowledge and data, it's, it's already there. And, and but the green infrastructure concept is, is is very good to communicate that because if if you have some environmental assessment book attached to marine spatial planning, well you you need some some skill to to understand what's written there. But you can deliver this information in much more easy, understandable way by using this concept, by showing that it, it, it does matter. <coughs> those, those who have written, they, they know what matters, but, but those who read not always are capable to grasp this uh, significance. And, and then this concept is, is very valuable. But that's my opinion. It's okay, yeah, Lena, how we can move forward, how we can communicate, so how we... Uh, yes, so, so at the international level, I think one, one good example was there explained uh, in the project as I was also involved in developing these essential fish habitats maps, because those are across international borders, as we saw. So that's clearly a way when uh, there's a real example of how to move forward internationally. And if you have a common understanding of what is meant by by the green infrastructure in that particular sense, it's helpful for communicating also the needs across those boundaries so that you can agree on, on it in the sense that all countries agree that, that this is something that we want. And we can define in a common way what we want and why we want it. For example, the important recruitment areas for fish in that example. <laughs> and naturally there could also be when you go down in scale a similar example if you look on a smaller habitat areas when maybe you cannot see that if you, if you make some, some activity in a certain area that's deteriorating the, the local habitat, maybe you think it's not so important because it's only there, it's just a small effect. But if you manage to see it as a part of a green infrastructure, you can show in the bigger picture what difference does it make. And that is also a basis when you plan that you understand what are the implications of your decision at the smaller scale when you scale it up to the bigger scale. And it's exactly the same thinking, only you can apply it on the regional or, or the national level. And I think if you, if you have the shared understanding of, of the ecological values and the provision of ecosystem services in that sense, you can call it green infrastructure. And then you agree on what you're talking about. And in that sense, it's a communication tool to help this process. So Helcom, Helcom will help uh, to spread it, yeah? To um, some comments here? Or? The remarks? Uh, because um, uh, at least at the Baltic uh, Sea region, I, I think that Helcom could be like, a, it's, it's this concept is worth of deepening and continuing and deepening the methodology and as the ecosystems are transnational, it's not a matter of 
a yeah. single country, but this transnational coordination should be here, and maybe that's also good for Helcom to continue this uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, some, some remarks or something, some uh, uh, questions from audience, or, or we are, oh yeah, please. For the implementation of the ecosystem-based approach, it is kind of crucial to um, define the limit of carrying capacity or somehow to calculate it. How do you think can the green infrastructure concept um, help with that? Who will go on? Uh, Yuris. Actually, I think at least according to my concept of green <laughs> infrastructure, it, it's, it's, it's perfect. Because you, you build this, this infrastructure virtually or whatever, and you see this, uh, there is a spawning ground, and then you can calculate the carrying capacity of the area, if, if you have knowledge, of course. That's another thing. And of course, you need data, because the spawning ground is there, but the quality of spawning ground might be not in the best shape. The, the spawning ground might be degraded and then you theoretically you have one value but but in practice you have a little bit different but but this concept allows to, to for each step to, to calculate carrying capacity and, and to account for it and then you see which link in this chain is limiting because you have probably population which is not not up to the standard but but you maybe not speculate reason why, but, but then you can mm -hmm. go through this chain and, and you can calculate it. Okay, one more question, please. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I don't worry, I haven't got much time, so I'll keep it short. In the presentations given, um, the earlier Latvian study highlighted how important muscles were um, uh, around um, the study area. And in a later presentation, it became clear that muscles were going to diminish um, by over the next period uh, due to climate change. Um, and so given the relative importance and given that we know that they're moving on, um, how does MSP help to manage the change and maintaining the green infrastructure that's been identified? <laughs> Maybe one to talk about the cocktails? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, um, okay, I'll try. It's just, just my guessing. I, no, maybe not guessing. Um, of course, uh, uh, Martin Special Planning can, cannot do anything with the climate change, like with the rising of temperature. Mm -hmm, nothing. Uh, I don't know what we can do, maybe. <laughs> I, I mean, this is also up to the biologists who can suggest that's what we can do <laughs> as a planner, Lena, <laughs> or to ecologists. Um, uh, I, uh, maybe, I, I'm just thinking, maybe the uh, these uh, not uh, nice uh, constructions of shore wind farms someday will become a new habitat for uh, muscles and uh, that will uh, have no place in other. I I, I don't know. I, I I have I have no idea. But but this is a yes. This is this what I what I talked about this Oscar presentation. It's good to know where the changes will be. So but then there's this discussion. To be prepared. New, yeah. yeah. Len, how are they? Len, yeah. How are to? There is a clear ecological component to this. I can admit so. <laughs> So, so when you look at the cumulative impact assessment then and look at all the different pressures that affect muscles in this case, uh, obviously climate change is important according to what we just learned, but there are other pressures as well. So uh, ensuring that other pressures are not too bad so that the capacity of the muscles anyway is such that it can be as resilient as we could expect would be the way to go. And in some cases, that is something that planning can do. In some cases, it's a clear case that you need to interact across sectors to look at the other components of the food web, how they contribute to the pressures. 
if I may, I will add, so the honest answer is no, it does not do anything. Uh, but there is a, another component in it. So you, you cannot turn back changes. They will occur nonetheless, whatever you do. But uh, this, this modeled uh, map shows where those spots are. And those are very, very, very valuable. Because that's what left. We have been discussing this among ourselves. What's the value? And, and the value rises with, with, with decrease of availability. So if you have only small hotspots available, those are very valuable. And you can account for that in marine spatial planning, of course, because those are the areas you must protect by all means, so there is no price for it anymore. OK, thank you for questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thanks uh, for presentations and also for, for, uh, for questions. Thank all the panelists. And uh, finally, uh, should, uh, sh should we call it green or blue infrastructure? We see that. Uh, we should call it blue. So next time will be blue infrastructure workshop. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for your time. There are still some uh, brochures from our project which, uh, where we still call it green infrastructure, but maybe can be useful for considering the co how to develop the concept in future.